Welcome to Go Time, your source for diverse discussions from all around the Go community. Thanks to our partners for helping us bring you the best developer pods each and every week. Fassy.com, Fly.io, and Typesense.org. Okay, here we go. So I know that when I said crypto, you all, some maybe thought, oh no, yet another scam. Not that type. We're talking about the library, right? The standard lib. What is new in the crypto library? What is uh, going on there? For maybe somebody who hasn't used it. Uh, we'll also cover a little bit on the, why was it added? What are some common uses of it? And obviously, what is new about that? And I am joined today by the security Go experts, Filippo and Roland, who were and are on the Go team. Would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Filippo, do you want to go first? Or? <laughs> Of course, yes. <laughs> a scary, um, spooky, uh, awkward <laughs> silence. <laughs> so uh, I'm Filippo. Uh, I used to be on the uh, on the Go team working with Roland, and I'm now an um, independent maintainer still working on the cryptography packages uh, of the Go standard library. So, you know, all of the uh, crypto slash and golang.org slash x slash crypto. So in, in a sense, uh, what we often say in the industry, uh, same team, different company. Yeah, and I'm uh, Roland Shoemaker. I'm on the Go team. I, I've been for about three years. I think I was technically recruited by Filippo. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I'm responsible for additional maintenance of the not only the crypto libraries, but all of the libraries that have some kind of security impact on Go. And then also for responding to and uh, triaging security issues in the standard library, not just in security specific libraries, but in everything. Before I worked on the Go team, I worked at the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the Internet Security Research Group uh, for five years on the Let's Encrypt project. One of my great successes right here, uh, <laughs> recruiting Roland <laughs> to take on all of the security reports. <laughs> yeah, and then immediately leaving. <laughs> Kind of how I started my way in the Go Meetup in Berlin. I was invited to be a co-organizer and then the co-organizer moved to London. <laughs> Great tactic. Yeah, always works. You always fall for I that. I can recommend it. I just, yeah, I just need to find my replacement now. Well, if anybody's listening to this episode, you know where to find Roland. <laughs> oh, so do we need to make this into a pitch. <laughs> it's like a blockchain that you sign the next person, right? Sorry. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> spooky, spooky jokes. Yeah. Um, so when when did uh, the crypto library join the standard libraries of Go? When, why? Was it there from the beginning? Yeah, very beginning. I think you can find it all the way back to when the tree was uh, open sourced, I think. And originally, they were mostly written by Adam Langley. Uh, who pretty much did with me what uh, I did with Roland. Uh, <laughs> Chain all the way. So yeah, he uh, designed a lot of the APIs. And we're now talking about 10, 11 years ago, something along those lines. And uh, for the time, it was amazingly modern as a, a set of APIs and selection of things to implement. Now, of course, 10 years is a lot of time, but it's been one of the major things we've focused on has been trying to keep things uh, modern and a good example in terms of uh, API design and implementation and reducing complexity, because that's what we were handed down from what existed already in the project. I, I think it was relatively revolutionary at the time to have kind of cryptography code in the standard library, rather than almost every other language requires you to rely on some third party implementation of this kind of stuff. Which is, you know, for better or worse. <laughs> but I think Go was really one of the languages, the first languages that really came with this stuff as like a first class implementation uh, that you could kind of trust uh, and rely on and not have to go and find kind of disparate implementations of all these different things. Yep. And specifically, they made it about, I, I think they, uh, they didn't focus on making a cryptography library, but on what Go developers would need. So TLS, right? HTTPS, it, mm, I think they saw correctly that would be something that you would have to link into almost every program because con doing a GET request to HTTPS URL, that's something we do almost all the time, right? Uh, API calls and all that. And for that, you need that 
the whole cryptography stack. Uh, and it was important that it could cross compile and that it would be native Go and all that. And so, and so from the beginning, the Go cryptography libraries are not about competing with other cryptography toolkits. So we don't compete on performance or on how many different things we implement that the others don't. But instead, we focus on are we providing Go developers what they need to develop Go applications? And I think that helped a lot with re reducing complexity and keeping keeping it focused initially informally and more recently with the Go cryptography principles, which were just a written down version of what I just said. And generally keeping the code quite secure, kind of as a default. Yeah, I think that's something that saved us from a lot of security vulnerabilities is that we don't implement everything. You know, there's a lot of things we have explicitly kind of put said like, you can, you can go and implement this yourself, but we don't think this is necessary in the standard library. And that has meant that every time there has been a huge, you know, security disclosure about some, you know, mm. custom curve parameters or something, <laughs> uh, we have not been affected because we have explicitly made those decisions to, to just not implement it. Yeah. And this is the part where uh, we take the opportunity to apologize to everybody we said no to on the issue tracker, <laughs> because they're probably listening to be like, yeah, tell me what's new, that, because my thing didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, but I will say from uh, jumping outside of the Go focus for one second, um, I'm preaching a lot the idea that I think Go is the lang one of the languages that will survive this AI revolution. And one of the many reasons to back that, but one of them is that all the, co all the code that is out there is secure by default. We try. <laughs> we definitely try. <laughs> yes. I mean, no. Uh, Go More secure than others, let's say, right? Yes. I mean, you just need to not to be the slowest person to run when a cheetah is chasing you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Roland and I are, uh, are always talking about the things that we wish were better, but it, it is entirely fair to say that uh, Go has much better posture than the average language, for sure. So what is uh, new in the in the crypto library for Go? And uh, when you answer that, and uh, I will say that we have a show notes and document and we have like a very long list there. So many things that are new. We only have this one hour. So whatever you choose to, to tell us about, it will be interesting also if you briefly say how it was and what is the change. So pick your favorite and just uh, share away and I'll be just asking you questions. Oh, we absolutely pre-gamed this uh, and we are talking about, <laughs> all right, so if we don't have time, what do we kill? And we're both like, well, those are all very good things. <laughs> kill your darlings. <laughs> that did not yeah. quite work. <laughs> not something we get to talk about all that often. So I think there's a backlog of very interesting <laughs> things that we've done that we all want to talk about, but <laughs> may not have time to get to everything. We can always have uh, episode uh, number two on the topic. And, uh, you know, we have 17 things here. So let's, uh, let's cover like eight. <laughs> Well, I think probably one of the biggest things that we've done recently, and this is something that you worked on, <laughs> was the RSA backend change, right? We, we have this, we've had for a very long time an RSA implementation that was based on a big integer library that we have in the standard library called MathBig. That is, because it is a generic big integer library is very hard to use and dangerous and not explicitly designed for cryptography. Yep. If you have the spooky music, this is where you put it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, and that, that was the basis of our, of our RSA implementation since, I think, since the beginning, which caused a lot of problems. <laughs> and the same was used in the ECDSA implementation. It was a little bit all over the uh, standard library because in cryptography, you often need to do things with big numbers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's tempting to say, oh, great, I will use this library that's called big numbers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then you regret it. Uh, because libraries that are not designed to be secure will optimize for things like feature completeness or performance and will end up you know, having 2,000 lines of code that have uh, code paths that might be reachable by attackers but not really looked at because they are only used if the number is a specific modulo, value module, something else, some very edge case or something like that. So the result is that MathBig was really not a robust basis for cryptography. So um, I set out to move MathBig out of the security perimeter. The goal was, even if there's a bug in MathBig, okay, it's a bug. It's not immediately a vulnerability. So that meant uh, producing a new begin implementation that was specifically about cryptography, which we call BigMod, 
And that started as an external contribution and was rewritten almost entirely uh, over to make it even smaller. And I think it worked out to 400 lines of code, something like that, down from the thousands of lines of uh, MathBig. And we used that to replace the backend of RSA, half the backend of the elliptic curve implementations, and so far, so good. Mm-hmm. You know, last famous words. Uh, <laughs> Roland maybe even, spooky, <laughs> even spooky has. Theme. I certainly didn't find any spooky tunes uh, <laughs> that, that are transition parts. It'd be very funny if, you know, uh, in a week a security uh, release comes <laughs> out and, and it has a, a vulnerability yeah. in it. <laughs> but of course, Roland cannot tell us. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll just, I'll, I'll, you know. I'll give you a wink if there's anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're we're live on uh, on video too. <laughs> oh, okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> Can be um, one of the snippets. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So, and this is uh, from what? Like, if you want to use that, what what is it already available? Yeah. So, if you noticed RSA getting slower in Go One uh, Twenty, that was that. That was me. I'm sorry. Uh, and then I went and made it faster in Go121. So RSA decryptions and signatures are now faster than we started at. But that's because they just used the new thing. But from the user point of view, nothing changed. It should still work exactly the same. It's just much more secure, maintainable, constant time, and so on. So all the other the hood. Yes. It also helped us uh, build a very visible change, which is the new package, Crypto ECDH. And that one is a whole new package to do the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, which is a key exchange. Uh, And before that package, you had to use something even lower level, which you'll be like, ECDH already sounds like something extremely (laughs) specific and low level. No, no, you had to just throw around. What does it stand for? When would you use it? Ron, do you want to? I've been talking a bunch. (laughs) (laughs) We we use it in in crypto TLS. It's it's the basis for a number of key exchanges that we, we have to do. For intercompatibility and before yeah right before we just reached deep into parts of the standard library that nobody should ever see or touch uh that were in hindsight probably a big mistake to add but we have to live with our mistakes yeah and this new library is you know replaces tens of lines of very scary looking code with a single call to an api that is incredibly well designed thanks to filippo <laughs> that as you know i think there's part part of what we've been trying to do over time is taking away the the rough edges of the crypto libraries that we have accumulated over almost 15 years at this point of you know design and an experience with getting things wrong <laughs> yeah exactly for example here the lesson is to not expose uh, low level concepts in the api uh, because before um so an elliptic curve point is a coordinate, you know, uh, X and Y, it's a point, to make it simple. And the current API just takes some bytes that are an encoding, and if the bytes are wrong, we can check and tell you. The old API actually took numbers for X and Y. So what happens if the X is too big? What happens if X is negative? It's not supposed to go negative. What happens if you pass in a negative number? The answers were not pretty. The answers are actually in the CV database, in the list of vulnerabilities. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So the new API, you just can't pass in a negative number because you can only pass in a bunch of bytes and we decide what they are and if they're valid or not. And there's no way for you to forget to validate something because when you pass in the bytes, we validate them because almost surely you didn't mean for us to skip validation that the old api we didn't let us do it in line so yeah a, a lot of this rewriting was deprecating the old elliptic curve api and designing the new one writing new backends just like with the rsa one so everything is constant time it uses uh, better formulas it uses generics uh, and it uses some formally verified code generator for the hardest parts where there's a computer that actually knows how to count, unlike most cryptographers, and produces the code to do the arithmetic correctly, automatically. And that's machine checked. And that's great because every library introduces bugs in the fiddly carries, carry the one situations of arithmetic. So yeah, that's that's an exciting new thing that we're adding. But Roland said something about the fact that we can never change things. And I feel like that brings us to the next thing. Before we go to the next thing, I want to say that I googled what ECDH stands for. And shame as many things in security, it's just 
uh, names of people. So it's uh, Elliptic Curve, Diffie, Hellman. Diffie, I know it's Whitfield Diffie, but Hellman, I don't know that person. The first name. I do not know the first name of uh, Hellman. No. <laughs> Although Diffie, Diffie still comes to the conferences. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you're like just sitting there and sipping coffee and you think like, yeah, that's, that's, that's Diffie. Huh. <laughs> well, I share yeah. this excitement with you and when I saw him once in a conference I asked to take a selfie I'm very happy you said that I was like debating whether I should say it or not yes, <laughs> yes. no I, I yes. <laughs> you know it kind of started the entire field of uh, public key cryptography I mean different people can can claim that but he definitely has a claim to it and yeah <laughs> I once sat in the room in a lecture room with uh, Professor Shamir from RSA Yes, that ooh, um, I have a very brief story about this. <laughs> I, I love um, this, uh, this uh, <laughs> fandoism that's going on. Well, George Tankersley and I presented a thing. It's now called Privacy Pass uh, at uh, Real World Crypto one year, and then in the it was using RSA. And George said in the presentation that uh, we would like to replace RSA because you know RSA. For the obvious reasons, you don't want to use RSA. And then somebody in the Q&A asked... You have to say what are those obvious reasons. And not everybody goes to crypto. Well, no, no, that's the thing. He didn't. Uh -huh, uh -huh, he didn't. Okay, he just okay. said that. <laughs> and uh -huh. everybody in the, in the room kind of nodded along because, you know, it's a little slower and it's... Just, some implementations, some schemes built on RSA are not as secure. RSA is fine. It's just kind of building with it, legacy tools. It's hard to get RSA right sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and you can build much more fancier things on top of elliptic curves. And in a room full of cryptographers, everybody wants to be using elliptic curves and not, and not RSA. It's the, it's the new framework, you know, the new JavaScript framework. Uh, <laughs> that, that's, I think, the, the parallel. Anyway, in the Q&A, somebody comes up and asks, so just uh, what is the problem with RSA, just if you could elaborate? And they were super polite, and and George goes like, "Well, you know, it's it's old and it's slow, and uh, we'd like to use something better and modern." Oh. And, and and the person goes like, "Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you." And then walks away. And somebody taps on my shoulder because George was on the podium and I was in the back backstage, and, and goes like, "Yeah, so that's from Rivest." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was great. <laughs> yeah, but at um, least they know they know the limitations of their own invention. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, of, of course, they're not going to the, shout at you about it. Uh, Ron Rivest being the R in RSA. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, he he was he was very okay with it. Anyway, <laughs> it's a, you have to be a big person to take uh, publicly criticism. Yeah, that's that's good to know. Okay, so we're covering the three things that you wanted to pick. Roland, tell us how we make changes without breaking the world. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Go has this great, probably one of the greatest things about Go is the compatibility guarantee, which is that every, you, know, you will be able to take code that you wrote 10 years ago and compile it today. And in theory, it should basically do the same thing. Another reason for Go surviving the AI revolution. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, I think it's one of the, one of the greatest uh, properties of the language. The problem is <laughs> sometimes you make the wrong decision and you end up with an API that is unfortunately bad in some way. The double-edged sword of the compatibility guarantee is that we cannot fix a lot of these problems. We need to either the security team technically is the only part of the Go team that has the right to break things. <laughs> We, you know, we have the uh, the escape valves sometimes, but we try and use that as sparingly as possible. But for you know, for for things like the elliptic curve API, you know, that we in theory we could have designed a better elliptic curve API, but there is too many things that rely on the old implementation and the ability to basically do whatever you want for for better or worse. So a, a lot of the time we kind of have to see what we can do behind the scenes to try and fix things as much as we can while leaving the old implementation basically is as make the change as invisible to the user as possible, which I think is harder for us, but makes the lives of users significantly better. You know, that the RSA backend change is a great example of this, right? There should be zero, the user should see nothing change at all, except for maybe performance. <laughs> yeah, I think that it's one of the things that are most easily overlooked is how much time the Go team spends discussing how to uphold the compatibility promise. It's really a major part of the job is figuring out what can we do that 
maintains backwards compatibility, which can be you know a whole new package and just deprecating the old one. But again, deprecating does not mean removing. And people always show up and like, you can't deprecate that, I'm using it. And we're like, that just means it says deprecated on it now. That also means there's no more support. Well, on you to maintain that, like on the user who wants to keep using it. Right. We will not add new features to it. Yes. If if you want a new... Will you patch things to deprecate it? Um... <sighs> so, <laughs> technically... <laughs> I promised hard questions. <laughs> we, have a, we have an out to not consider vulnerabilities in deprecated packages as vulnerabilities, but I don't think we ever exercised that. Right. We, we will raise the bar slightly higher. If there's a vulnerability that doesn't necessarily, you know, isn't really bad, is something that like, you know, could cause a program to panic or, you know, something with a slightly lower impact, we may choose not to patch it Mm -hmm. or just make it a publicly known bug and say, we're not going to patch this using the security patching process. But if somebody wants to fix it, we may accept a patch, Mm -hmm. but we still Technically, you know, if something is a security, a big enough security issue in a deprecated package, it's still a package in the standard library. People can still rely on it. So mm-hmm. I think we we feel like we should still be fixing those issues. I don't think we ever faced it, and I can't quite speak for the policy of the security uh, team anymore. But I think it would also depend on how long something has been deprecated. Yeah, things mm-hmm. that we deprecated six years ago. I mean, maybe things that we deprecated this year. With, uh, yeah, still fresh. An example of this would be the OpenPGP package. Right. There are known issues in the OpenPGP package and, you know, minor security issues, but they're the kind of things that cannot really be fixed without breaking the API. It is like an inherent problem with either the design of the OpenPGP package or the design of OpenPGP in general. Um, so there's not much we can do there. Mm-hmm. And in th- those cases, we've, you know, we've taken our hands off that package. And, th- and there is a an open source maintained alternative, which is another reason, you know, when, when there are work publicly known workarounds uh, that a user can apply themselves, such as u- using a different package or using an API, holding an API in a slightly different way, it does mean that it lets us reconsider whether we need to be the, the people fixing the problem. However, there are times when we just can't do without visible changes. And those are, for example, the, the default changes of uh, as time goes on and protocols advance and hashes uh, get broken, which is less of a thing now. You know, it's been what fifteen years <laughs> since a hash has been weakened uh, significantly. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wonder how many things we'll listen uh, this podcast for and be like, Filippo couldn't shut up, could he? Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, the internet, the connection's breaking. <laughs> 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 but for example, uh, there are things like supporting MD5 and SHA-1 in CryptoX509 for those certificates uh, or uh, TLS 1.0 and TLS 1.1 that we have to, at some point, change. And we try to do that as slow a uh, staged rollout as possible. For example, SSL v3, which was the very, very, very broken version, which SSL v3 is the one before TLS 1.0, because cryptographers can't do marketing for the life of them. Blame Netscape for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that was a fun time in cryptography. That I wasn't around, but it was just <laughs> anyway. That one we first disabled by default uh, and then removed the code years later. And now we're we're doing the same with uh, TLS 1.0 and 1.1. We go look at how many clients will need that, how many would break, and we are inching towards disabling it by default. I think it's already disabled by default in clients. And that's the thing I had the courage to do. And now uh, Roland is having the courage to push uh, the (laughs) disabling by default on the server side, (laughs) which I chickened out of the (laughs) the last time. And uh, applications can still turn it back on by setting min version. So this is just about the default. And that's such a constant tension because we both want defaults to be secure, right? You should be able to just say, hey, make a TLS connection and not know anything about what I just said. What what the hell is a TLS 1.0? And surely not have an opinion on TLS 1.0 versus TLS 1.2. That's our job, not the application developer. But at the same time, if we change defaults, we change the behavior. 
And if we change behavior, we break applications that used to work. And that's not great because then people don't upgrade and then they find us at GopherCon and they are lovely people and we absolutely love them. And I'm not kidding, uh, but, but still, then the conversation becomes, hey, so that Shawan deprecation thing. <laughs> so yeah, so there's a new mechanism. Uh, Ron, want to talk about go debugs? Uh, that that is the thing we talk about every time we are together. So. Yeah, I think SHA-1 was the first thing we tried to deprecate that ended up being a real painful experience. Mm -hmm. um, and, but Go Debugs kind of did save us there. And, and Go Debug is this idea that you can, it's a way of a kind of out of band way of enabling behavior in the Go runtime or the standard library via environment variables. So you can, we can add a new behavior and then gate it on the presence of a, go, a special go debug flag. Yeah. Which, by the way, is a terrible name for this <laughs> mechanism, but is a historical artifact. There was already a go debug environment variable. It's the one you use mm -hmm. to say, hey, I want to know about the garbage collector poses or things like that. And so we just kind of piggybacked on that yeah. um, to, <laughs> to be like, oh, you know, if you want to turn SHA-1 back on, uh, you can yeah, do it. It was already there. Yeah. <laughs> We probably shouldn't have, but now everybody uses it. Yeah. And so now it's called GoDebug, and it's a much wider yeah. mechanism. Sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, and, and it's used all over the standard library now, and, and there has been a lot of work to make this a kind of the way. I mean, really, a bet, we also have the Go experiments flag. <laughs> really, it would be probably, well, maybe there's a third name that we could have come up with, but... <laughs> It's, you know, it's a really useful way for us to be able to preserve behavior because there is often things that we want to change the default for or change the behavior for in general because it provides a better experience for the user. Um, and there is no, you know, often with these things, there's no elegant way to make it configurable through an API. Maybe that's because the API is designed in such a way that we cannot pass additional information or for a number of reasons. But we know that making the default change will break somebody. And, and often there are, you know, there are valid use cases for things that we think aren't the thing that everyone should be doing. You know, for, for TLS 1 and TLS 1.1, there are servers out there and clients out there that do not support higher versions of TLS. And users, you know, we should provide a way for users to support those use cases. Uh, we just don't think <laughs> it's safe for everyone to do that. Also because sometimes leaving something enabled is dangerous even if it's not used. Um, this is a thing with uh, TLS um, cipher suites. On the one hand, uh, we recently took away a little bit of configurability uh, with the um, automatic cipher suite ordering, which I'm so proud of, by the way. Basically, you can still turn on and off cipher suites, which are the different primitives, the different encryption methods used by TLS with the tls.config.cipher suites. So you can still use that to say, I want to enable that one, I want to disable that one. But it used to be that the order you put them in was important. You are supposed to express an opinion about whether you liked um, TLS, ECDHE, RSA, ChaCha20, Poly1305 better or uh, SHA256 better or worse than TLS, RSA, AES256, SHA1. You know, if you have, pick a favorite. Which one do you like better? <laughs> and it can be another unpopular opinion vote. <laughs> the answer to this. And the thing is, no application developer cares about this. And that's not strictly true because people obviously yelled at me for taking away that uh, configurability. <laughs> but the, most application developers don't care. So now we'll take the hint on whether you turn something on or off. But then we will decide which ones are the better ones and which ones are the worst ones. And so we'll pick the priority order ourselves. And that helps us because it lets us keep enabled things that are not as secure because we know we'll only pick them as the very last resort. And that helps us keep things enabled. But on the other hand, there are things that just by being enabled expose you to security risks, even if nobody uses them. And these are the RSA cyber suites. Those give an attacker the opportunity to try to mount a specific attack, the Blickenbacker 
attack is it the coppersmith or the Blakenbacker? The Blakenbacker. Blakenbacker. Yeah. Yep. The 98 one, right? Because mm-hmm. Blakenbacker has so many attacks that we have to use the yeah. Ability, which, yep. Uh, it has resurfaced a number of times. Oh, yes. <laughs> Can you just elaborate about the two? That is such a... I was like, are they the, are they saying things to see if I'm following? <laughs> um, so there are two very different attacks. Um, the Blakenbacker um, 98 attack, which is... Blakenbacker is just the name of a cryptographer. As, as it is common in the field. <laughs> yep. Uh, found a way to attack RSA in such a way that if you don't do everything in perfectly constant time, so it, it needs to be impossible to tell apart whether a decryption succeeded or failed, which you're saying, wait, but if a decryption fails, you return an error, right? Well, no, 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 that would be very bad because if the attacker can see the errors or even just time the operation and be like, aha, I saw you exited earlier because there was an error. So now I know that this was not valid. It can keep sending invalid things until it hits a valid one and then move to the next one. You know how in uh, uh, Hollywood, sometimes they figure out the combination of a safe one thing at a time and just goes like very fast, one, two, three, four, five, seven, and, and then, oh, it hits the right one, locks that one and moves to the next one. It clicks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So that's actually a thing in cryptography. Mm-hmm. A, a bunch of attacks yes. work like that. <laughs> and the Blake and Becker 98 one works like that. So it, it searches when is it not the same time, basically, then it knows that that's an error. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and... Instead, the Blake Macro 6 is an attack against signatures. In that attack, basically, you can make an approximate value that looks like a signature but has some garbage in it. And if the implementation ignores the garbage, then you just made a fake signature. And it's another very fun one that keeps resurfacing from time to time. Wait. It, will it accept it or will it not accept it? It will accept it. If it's, so, if it's, if it's a correct one with garbage, is it considered fake? Well, no, uh, that's the thing. Uh, Anybody with only the public key without the private key should not be allowed to make a signature, right? Because only the person with the private key should be able to make a valid signature. But anybody can make something that's close to a valid signature, but has a bunch of garbage in one of the fields. Mm -hmm. Uh, Imagine a JSON struct that has an additional entry with some garbage in it. That one, anybody can make. So if you don't check in the verification code that there isn't extra garbage anywhere, then you will end up accepting fake signatures Mm -hmm. that were generated by people without... If you generate enough fields, you get all the right ones and lots of trash. Yeah, it's basically... So the math behind it is that signatures are a a cube root of a number, Mm -hmm. and you can approximate one by just doing the cube root like you do it on a pen and paper cube roots, which is not something I actually know how to do, but you can Google it and find <laughs> out how, which is what I do when I have to implement this stuff. And that one will come close. But close is indistinguishable from right with some garbage at the end. And so that's the Blake and Macro 6. I myself made a vulnerable implementation for the YouTube DL self-update um, <laughs> code and was saved by the fact that I had added some extra safeties that 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 saved YouTube DL, but <laughs> yeah, uh, turns out. You hard-coded the exponent? Yes, uh, mm. I hard-coded the exponent to the 65k one. So <laughs> I remember the panic when years later I realized, <laughs> wait, I remember years ago writing a from scratch implementation of RSA for YouTube DL because we couldn't use any dependencies and it was just this self-contained Python script. And I was like, oh, I must have gotten that wrong. I was like 17. (laughs) Uh, And so I went back and yes, I had gotten wrong, but I had saved myself. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Anyway. Making better decisions than professional cryptographers at the time. So (laughs) (laughs) I've got nothing nice to say. So yeah, go to bugs. Go to bugs allow us uh, to make changes like turning off these RSA ciphers that allow the attacker to mount the Blakenbacker 98 attacks and turning off TLS 1.0 and, and so on while giving people a way to escape. Also, I don't know, Ron, if you want to explain how they relate to Go versions and the new uh, backwards compatibility policy. Oh. <laughs> you were explaining it to me earlier. Yeah, there's this very nice new behavior where we, when you introduce a new, a new Go debug flag, it, def- it enables 
some behavior by default for everyone. Uh, and there is, you know, if you look in your Go module file, there is this line that specifies what version of Go this module is supposed to be used with. And there are the new policy for Go debugs is that, you know, we record which major version a Go debug flag was introduced in. And then the tool chain can kind of emulate older versions of the tool chain by saying, you know, if this Go debug flag was added in a version later than the Go version recorded in your module file, the tool chain will act as if, you know, that Go debug flag is enabled by default. So you get the old behavior. So your tool chain acts as if it is, you know, you're using Go 120, but it's acting as if it's Go 119. Uh, which allows us, it, you know, pre preserves the backward, backwards compatibility degree because it allows you to kind of get the old behavior that you were expecting. Uh, and for, for some things, that's, you know, that's good. <laughs> for some things, you know, we need to try and figure out a better way to handle security issues, but that's on the roadmap for, to figure out. Yeah, I'm very excited about it because it allows us to make these sort of changes with much more confidence that we're not just springing it on everybody and people can upgrade and notice when something is not working. There's metrics connected to it, so you can get a metric that warns you, hey, you're doing the non-default thing here, so you're probably going to break. Uh, and if you revert it, then you have a metric that when it goes to zero, then you can say, oh, great, we don't have a need for that legacy behavior anymore. And that will eventually allow us, you know, with the, the telemetry proposal kind of covers some of this, but this will eventually also allow us to decide, you know, currently Go debug flags are kind of there forever. There are some, you know, sometimes we say, oh, we'll, we've added this Go debug flag and then we'll remove it in, you know, X number of major versions. but Often that doesn't happen because it turns out that it's really hard to figure out who is using Go debug flags, whether they're actually still necessary. Um, so these metrics, you know, the idea is that eventually these will be collected somewhere and exposed uh, for analysis so that we can figure out, you know, maybe we don't need the SHA-1 re-enable flag anymore. And we can actually, <laughs> we can finally remove it. I don't expect that will happen for a no. couple of years, but... <laughs> But I've got a bottle for that day. It's... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll have a party. Uh, it will, I think it will happen about 10 years after we thought it would happen, unfortunately. All right. So talking of, about certificates, there is one thing that we added that uh, I'm always excited to lead, uh, tell uh, people about. And by we, I mean you. The, the fallback routes. Yes. <laughs> this is a long, a long time coming. Go is, is kind of unique. For languages that provide a TLS stack, Go is slightly unique in that it doesn't, or, well, it still technically doesn't provide a bundle of, of root certificates that it trusts. Most languages that have a TLS stack will come bundled with, you know, the set of root certificates that your computer should trust when making a TLS connection to a website. And that's been a, um, we use the system roots when we do that. So on Windows, that. Windows has its own root store, Apple has its own root store, and Linux is very complicated in that it has 18 different root stores depending on what distribution you're using. And none of them are good. <laughs> no, they're all bad. Well, eh, <laughs> some of them are better than others. <laughs> Fair. But th this has been a problem for a long time because, uh, especially for people who use Docker, because if you build a very lightweight Docker image, often you will not end up with a root store. And when, when you try and you, you know, write a Go program and you drop it into your Docker image, your lightweight Docker image, and then you try and connect to a, a TLS, you know, a web server that uses TLS, all of a sudden you're getting all these failures and it's kind of confusing why. So we have in 121, I think, we added a new API that allowed you to register a default set of root certificates to trust. So if you don't get anything from the system, you will get this special extra bundle of certificates that you will fall back on. And this is, I think, solved a problem for a lot of people, <laughs> but may maybe introduced new problems for us <laughs> <laughs> in that we, we now have to also provide a bundle of certificates, which we have done as a, as a separate module in the um, golang.org X crypto module. As a, it's a special sub-module, which provides the Mozilla bundle of certificates. Yeah, the, the trick is that we actually want nobody to use the new API except <laughs> that one package that you can import. Yeah. <laughs> and if you import it, it automatically registers the bundle. 
And it's a separate module because uh, that way it can be updated separately. And that way it can be flagged in uh, GoVuln check, uh, the vulnerability database, so that we can tell users when they really need to update it because the roots have changed. And then Roland wrote a whole bot that uh, sends yells automatically to update the list. And I get these emails being like, no changes abandoned. Or, oh, yeah, a bunch of roots changed. Or, yeah, actually, I've gone and deleted all of the roots. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it it turned out that I had forgotten to check the HTTP status code on the response that I got from the server that serves the text file that contains (laughs) all certificates. So it was, you know, 404-ing or 500-ing or something. And I was just like, oh, okay, that just means there are no certificates. (laughs) But we fixed that. (laughs) Yes, and and to be clear, that just sends an automated PR, so no harm was done. Uh. (laughs) Yeah, there still needs to be two humans who look at this before (laughs) before we actually make any change. Two Googlers. To, yeah, anyway, yeah, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> moving on. Are they to... already AI people. <laughs> <laughs> Google AI bots. Two barns. Oh, that would make my life so much easier. <laughs> 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 well, maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that, that, that's job security. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we do like having jobs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think I will ask this at the end. I'll, get, I'll ask this now so you'll think about this for, for like mm-hmm. the next couple of minutes in the back of your head. But uh, at the end, I will ask you, what do you see the development of the security role in the world of AI? Mm. Oh, God. Think about it and then <laughs> okay. we'll come back to that. So, oh, uh, this is going to be an extra uh, popular yeah. opinion, like a, <laughs> uh, <laughs> a bonus one. Yeah. I think a, a good thing to follow on from the, the Go debug discussion would be You know, we have this great, you know, we try and keep everything as compatible as possible. We have this great way to introduce behavior that may be breaking. But I think there is also a discussion about what we want to do in the future, where, you know, there are APIs we cannot change. Just, you know, they are what they are. And what we want to kind of how, in those cases, our only real option is to introduce a completely new package. And we've done, this has been done very sparingly. Uh, in the standard library thus far, but I think it is probably, you know, the world has changed a lot since the, not just the crypto tree was written, but a lot of the packages in the standard library were written. Um, We're kind of looking at this point to what does, you know, if not a (laughs) go-to, but a V2 of certain packages in the standard library look like. Um, The the first big one that this has happened for is the MathRand package. I don't know if you want to talk about that at all, Filippo. Yeah, so MathRand is one of the things that ended up on every presentation about GoFood guns. Uh, because there's CryptoRand, which is good, and there's MathRand, which is bad. And they are both called RAND, and they both have a read m- method. So you might be excused for using RAND.read to generate your session ticket keys, and then find out that actually you are importing MathRand in that, pack- in that file, and so you ended up using MathRand to generate keys which, why is it bad? It's bad because it's completely predictable. And I'm not just saying it has like a bad (laughs) seed or anything like that. I'm saying if I look at a few of the outputs, I can predict the future ones. There is no secure way to use MathRand up to now. But MathRand is getting a V2 and the V2 Critical doesn't have a read method, so it can't be mistakenly used as easily uh, in place of uh, CryptoRand. And it's switching its default, and this is, I think here I can only claim credit for lobbying for this, but uh, Russ Cox then went and did all of the actual implementation. But I think I convinced Russ to make the default ChaCha8, which is this reduced round version of the ChaCha20 thing that um, you use in TLS sometimes. It's a cryptographic cipher, so it's actually secure, and it's almost as fast as the non-secure fast thing. So it will default to that, so that if by mistake you use my friend, you'll actually not have done that much damage. It will probably still be secure, and I am so happy about that. And we're getting that in the V2. And V2 will not even have, it will have a default source, which is this, and it will not be locked to a specific sequence of outputs because that was the other major thing that was a problem in my friend. It could never change what outputs it returned because um, programs had come to rely on those. And that's how seriously we take the compatibility promise. Wait, rely on MathRand being? Yeah, deterministically random. Okay. 
So Mafran will always return the same outputs if you give it the same seed. Yeah, yeah, but but companies relying on Mathran to be persistent is the thing I needed to hear twice. Okay. <laughs> oh yes, you change the sequence and things break. It's great. Really, like open source maintenance is great, and if you are looking for something <laughs> that's more mind bending, I can recommend standard library maintenance. <laughs> is that your other unpopular opinion? <laughs> <laughs> But yes, I'm excited about V2, and we are starting to think about what V2s of packages in the in the crypto, well, of the crypto packages would look like, because there are things like AADs, which are just a fancy name for the thing that encrypts stuff, like AES two fifty six GCM or ChaCha twenty poll thirteen o five. So you have a key and a message, and you want to encrypt it. And right now, the API is kind of hard to use. You have to separately generate the nonce and have opinions on how to generate the nonce and then where to put it. And nonce is a number used once, so it has to never, never, ever repeat. And what happens if it repeats? It depends. depends what you were using. It could be catastrophic. It could be... Most of the times, it's catastrophic. <laughs> but sometimes, it's okay. But how do you know? You don't. So we want to make higher-level APIs for that and things that just say, yeah, you know, We'll take care of generating it. We will prepend it to the ciphertext. You don't even have to know it exists. Uh, don't even need to know it's a thing. And then we'll pick primitives where we can do that instead of having to ask the application to respect some strict rules or else. And so that means, for example, making new APIs that expose X ChaCha Poly 1305 instead of ChaCha 20 Poly 1305, which should anybody care about the difference between the X and the known X? <laughs> well, nobody should, but it is very important because it will make the difference between uh, you're allowed to encrypt at most a couple million messages, which, you know, sometimes you have more than two million files or not having that problem. Right. And we, we shouldn't require users to kind of know these arcane details in order to make secure decisions. I think that's one of the real problems with a lot of the, the cryptography libraries are good. <laughs> But they assume you have a lot of knowledge in order to use them safely. Which still less than other cryptography libraries. Oh. I feel like we tend to be a little too doom and gloom, the two of us, sure. uh, because we want it to be better. Uh, but I think that's because the, the bar is already so high for the Go standard library, right? We, we, have, we made good decisions. We didn't make the best decisions. But in the grander scheme of things, we're still doing a lot better than a lot of other people. Yep. But yeah, I, I'm excited. I think this is one of the most exciting times to be working on the um, cryptography libraries because we get to uh, make the mistakes that will haunt us for the next 10 years. And that's fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, and you say that, right? We're kind of probably the biggest thing that will come in the standard library. The crypto part of the standard library in the next two or three years will be post-quantum algorithms. Yes. Which, you know, are very cutting edge at the moment. And I think we are, you know, we will get exact, like you say, we will get to make API design choices that may come back to haunt us in, <laughs> in five or 10 years time. Uh, we kind of, you know, we don't have the 20 years of design experience or usage experience of these algorithms that <laughs> we have with RSA. It and... sounds like an episode number three <laughs> on the topic where episode number two is the second half of this list. And Episode number three is all the quantum things that you're planning to put in it. Yeah, um, or all the mistakes we've made. And uh, <laughs> and we'll be making. This is the list of the mistakes that I plan to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Indeed, there was a lot more stuff on, on the list because it's exciting also because we're now getting to uh, work on things like SSH and there are uh, more people on board. There's uh, Nicola Morino now who's working on the... Uh, golang.org slash x slash crypto slash uh, ssh package which possibly one of the underestimated packages in our yeah. purview that really needed a maintainer yep it's second perhaps the to the tls package as one of the most important packages that nobody thinks about <laughs> maybe because it works a little too well but you know that's not <laughs> yeah. true forever the our ssh package had started to rot uh, i remember sp just scrambling because it was about to stop working with the github and that would have been bad for all of the ci really? companies for mm -hmm. reasons you can imagine and so we had to roll out very quickly the changes but now instead we are much more ahead of the curve. I think we implemented a thing like support for keystroke obfuscation 
at the same time as OpenSSH added it, which is six years faster than we've usually been able to do. So I'm very happy about what Nicola is doing. Uh, maybe we will have Nicola on for, for episode two, <laughs> for part two. Yeah, that sounds like a good plan. What else sounds like a good plan? So, gentlemen, what did you bring with you as an unpopular opinion? I, I have an I have an opinion that is tactically chosen to annoy the most people possible. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is legit in this section. <laughs> okay, so uh, there is, you know, one of the ongoing debates between software engineers is what is the best terminal text editor. Okay, Filippo <laughs> <laughs> is making a great face. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a scary body language. Right. This is typically this argument is between people who really enjoy Emacs and people who really enjoy Vi or Vim. Uh, I take the third position, so I think that they're both terrible, <laughs> and that in fact the best text editor is Pico, which <laughs> which is a wonder. It's incredibly lightweight. It tells you all of the shortcuts that you need. You know, you don't have to find a secret manual somewhere. It just does what you want. And it's on almost every system. I strongly disagree. I actually think the best <laughs> one is Joe, which is the only one I ever <laughs> learned to use. You're going to have to add links to both of them in the show notes for people to know what are you talking about. Oh, oh Joe is an even simpler and uh, more for, you know, beginner's version. Yeah. Of, uh... <laughs> it's great for people who are programming in Doctor Scheme. <laughs> I think my opinion is is very much formulated by the fact that the very first I learned how to use email from my mother, who would had a you know an email account from her university and would tell you know tell that into a server at the university and use Alpine, which is a very old email client that is I, I Alpine is actually terrible, but <laughs> but Pico is a text editor based on the semantics of Alpine. <laughs> So when I first started actually doing software engineering and I was using, you know, I was like, oh, I can own, you know, I, now I use an IDE because I'm a normal person. But <laughs> at first I was like, oh, I have to use my terminal text editor because that's what ev all the cool people do. And I, you know, Emacs and Vim both make, make me cry. I, <laughs> I have tried multiple times to use both of them and I just cannot get, a, get my head around it. And Pico was just great because you just, you know, you just type in, in it like you would a normal text editor and it has shortcuts, but it has a little bar at the bottom that tells you what the shortcuts are. So if you, if you forget, it's very easy to figure out, <laughs> but I don't, this is not something I will tell people when I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I am exposing my greatest secret right now. <laughs> no, no, I, I truly enjoy that. We spent like an hour talking about the intricacies of cryptography and being like, oh yeah, the Go security team. And then we just went all out with, we, we disagree on which editor is the best because we use two of the simplest editors possible. Yep. <laughs> This is like when people say, oh, real programmers use keyboard shortcuts for everything. They don't touch the mouse. And Rob Pike answers, I guess I'm not a real programmer then. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yep, because Plan 9 is entirely mouse-based. Uh, well, not entirely, but you do a lot with the mouse because, you know, 2D input is actually kind of nice. Yeah, it turns out the mouse was a good invention. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's, it's totally okay to use the mouse. Uh. <laughs> or a keypad. We're not judging. <laughs> yes. Filippo, do you have an unpopular opinion or have you been just sharing them throughout the episode? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with, with one that's more topical this time. And uh, this one, I think, will have the opposite effect of Roland. <laughs> it will make very upset, but a tiny amount of uh, the listeners. So there's these elliptic curves that are the NIST elliptic curves, the ones uh, standardized by the National Institute of standards and technology and technology thank you and it's a, a u.s agency and they have collaborations with the nsa and you know there are people who think that they're clearly 
in cahoots and clearly trying to sabotage all of the cryptography and including the new post-quantum stuff and and so on. And then there's these other curves, which are half of their selling point is that they're not made by NIST, who's evil, right? And my unpopular opinion is that the NIST curves are great. They're absolutely fine. They had the problem, they used to have the problem that we didn't have good formulas for them, like very specifically mathematical formulas. And then, was it Barreto, I think? Uh, anyway, in 2016 or something like that, they, these cryptographers just published a paper with better formulas for them. And now we have the good formulas for them. And now they're great. They are prime order curves. They are generated from a hash. Do we know what the hash is? No. Trying to work with mm-hmm. on that. If anybody finds it, there I have twelve thousand dollars for them. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I like actually have twelve thousand dollars earmarked for <laughs> as a challenge. You can search NIST. Philippe is drawing this with case. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not quite literally, but yes. You know, honestly, if you want to make it a suitcase <laughs> delivery, if you found the seeds, I will deliver the bounty to you in a suitcase. What about a, a burlap sack with a dollar sign on the side? It seems more appealing to me, but... I'm a theater kid. I will absolutely go for such a drama. <laughs> <laughs> you would just make me happy. There is the thing where you can't cross borders with more than 10K. We will figure yeah, it out. $10,000. <laughs> we'll figure it out. I'm Italian. I'm, I'm sure we, 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 I can... <laughs> we can work I, something out. I, I can work it out. But anyway, do we know exactly the, all the history of it? No, but they are... They're safe enough. They've been secure for years and they actually have less problems than alternative curves these days. So actually, NIST curves are fine. And this will sound like the least unpopular opinion to a bunch of people and then a bunch of, a (laughs) few other people instead will scream in my mentions in like two hours. Okay, let's see. Let's see if the unpopular (laughs) opinion and the prediction were working. I'm coming with an unpopular opinion that is uh, not fun and not easy and not lo- and uh, sure is loaded and affected by the situation recently or everything that's been going on. I've uh, I've just been talking, started talking about how I'm, I'm coming out of the quite hard two weeks. So I think that uh, taking hostages, babies and little kids should be condemned by everyone and should not be associated with one political opinion, another or the lack of it. Good luck to me having this on on the Twitter poll. But I I do want to say that. And I want to say thank you very much to you both for joining. Thank you. Thank you for having us. There will be episode number two (laughs) on the second part of the list. There will be an episode number three on the quantum stuff. And until then, have a happy Halloween. Like this spooky rendition of the Go Time theme, check out our new music album on Spotify and Apple Music. Yes, Changelog Beats is now a thing. Our zeroth volume is called Theme Songs, and it includes special remixes in addition to the classics. And our first volume is called Next Level, featuring many of the video game inspired tracks you've heard on Go Time over the years. Just search for Changelog Beats in your music playing app of choice. You'll find us. Thanks once again to our partners. Fastly.com, fly.io, and typesense.org. And to Breakmaster Cylinder for collabing with us on all our music. That's all for now, but we'll talk to you again next time on Go Time.